Well, good morning again. We are studying the book of Hebrews, and uh, some of this is so complicated that I overlap some of it. I don't apologize for that. I'm simply telling you that that is the case. Let's open with prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the weather we've been having. We thank you for the beautiful days. And we thank you that things seem to be cooling off with regard to the pandemic of the virus. We are anxious to be rid of this and to once again congregate to study your word, to worship you, and to bless your name. And we ask you to help us to go back into business. For we say thank you, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, this is the broad outline of uh, Hebrews. And uh, who he is uh, will occupy the first seven chapters. I'm going to start with chapter two today. And so this slide is not totally pertinent to us. But here we go into chapter two. We're going to try to cover the entire chapter, but there are some cross-references and so on. And we may not be able to complete it in this lesson, or the lesson may run over. And since I assume it is not interfering with your lunch, if I do run over, I may have to do that. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1. For this reason we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. Now, the reason he's talking about it comes from chapter 1. And the reason is, is that um, after explaining the magnificence of who Jesus is in the first chapter, we then considers the law of Moses, which began with the, what we call the Ten Commandments on the top of Mount Sinai. And it was, uh, it was spoken at first, God spoke it on the top, and then uh, that scared the people and they asked Moses to use, listen to God and then tell them what he said and they would do it, but don't let him talk to them anymore. Now, the, the law that was pronounced was uh, fairly rigid. Uh, it was, obviously was rigid because nobody could keep it. And uh, yet, the apparent means to salvation at that time was keeping that law. Now, He's been talking about things that come through the Son. The Son being Jesus, the Son of God. And he is so much better. Uh, if, he, if he announces a means for uh, salvation, you had better pay more attention to it than to that law that you could not keep. But if you're not careful, you will drift away from it. If the word spoken through angels, the law, and it was a Jewish uh, idea that the law was uh, transmitted, brought through the angels, and I'll show you in a little while uh, some uh, New Testament confirmation of that. If it proved an unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, 
here's the New Testament thing. In Acts chapter uh, 7, we are looking at the time when Stephen was reviewing the history of Israel. And this ended up in his death. He was the first martyr. And he says, this is the Moses. He's talking about Moses now. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers and he received living oracles to pass on to you. And remember, when the people reached Mount Sinai after they left Egypt, Moses went up on top of the mountain. This was after they had verbally heard the Ten Commandments. He went up there and spent about 40 days up on the top of the mountain, actually listening and talking to God. And so Moses gets credit for receiving the law, and in fact it's called the Mosaic Law in many cases. So how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It was at first spoken through the Lord and confirmed to us by those who heard. It was the Lord himself on the top of Mount Sinai who pronounced the Mosaic Law. God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Now this introduces a, a new idea, a new subject, and that is signs and miracles and the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, <clears throat> in the New Testament, Luke chapter 7, John the Baptist had been the forerunner of Jesus. He pointed to him as uh, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And he was faithful for a time, but then he accused uh, Herod Antipas. Uh, he didn't just accuse him, he condemned him because he married his brother's wife. And he got thrown in jail. Ultimately will be killed. So while he's in jail, we're, we're uncertain how much, when he began to doubt Jesus or if he really did. But he sent a couple of men, he cut a couple of his disciples to Jesus. And they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, are you the expected one, the Messiah? Or do we look for someone else? And he, Jesus, answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you've seen and heard. Now, instead of saying, well, Of course I am, I'm the Son of God, and uh, you know it, he gave him the evidence because it had been prophesied that when the Messiah arrived, he would perform certain miracles and signs and wonders. He said, go and report to John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Well, that's a way of saying, yes, I am the one. It was prophesied that I would do these things, and you have seen and heard that I have done them. For he, God, didn't subject to angels the world to come, according which we are, concerning which we are speaking. This is the world to come, the life after death. But 
one has testified somewhere, and that is going to be Psalm 8, saying, What is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you're concerned about him? You've made him for a little while lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor, and have appointed him over the works of your hands. Did not appoint any angel. You have appointed a man who has been made for a little while lower than the angels to be over the works of your hand. Psalm 8 verse 5 says, You made him man now. He's talking about Adam and Eve, a little lower than God, Elohim, and you crown him with glory and majesty. Now, there's a note here. The Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, says angels instead of the Hebrew word Elohim. The original text in Psalm 8 meant a little bit lower than angels, while the text in Hebrews means, for a short time, he has been lower than man, or lower than the angels, or lower than Elohim. And God said, now this is a quotation from Genesis, Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now watch the rest of this. And let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now this is a pretty uh, extensive, comprehensive dominion that God had, uh, had given to man over the creation. And in, in Hebrews it says, you have put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, what he's talking about here is not Jesus, but mankind in the form of Adam and Eve. He says, in subjecting all things to him, man, notice the him is not capitalized, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we don't yet see all things subjected to him. And my note is that when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden and died, they forfeited, they gave it away, they turned over this extensive dominion and they gave it over to Satan. When Satan challenged Jesus and tempted Jesus in the wilderness, he said, all this is mine. Jesus did not dispute that. But what he did was offer Jesus all of these nations and everything if Jesus would fall down and worship him. That didn't work. But Jesus did not dispute that he now had authority over the earth and its contents. But we do see him, capitalized him, Jesus, who was made for a little while lower than the angels. A little while, not a little bit. Namely, Jesus. Because of the suffering of death, would crown Stephano. This is a Greek. This is the the <clears throat> the kind of crown that is given to a victor in the games. It's a it's a crown of victory. So he was crowned with victory, with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God. He might taste death for Hooper, everyone.
So Jesus died for every one. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect. Now perfect is teleo, and that means brought to the desired end, the completion. The author, he is the author, the archegos of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies, makes holy, and those who are sanctified are all from one Father. For which reason he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call them brethren. They have, been, they have become the sons and daughters of God the Father, and so Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, but it's, that is all contained in the, in the word brethren. <clears throat> this is a quotation from Romans 11. From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. In Colossians we are told, By him all things were created. We know that God the Father spoke, spoke the order for creation. But Jesus actually did the work of creation. And we also understand that the Holy Spirit served as the architect of creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Worthy are you, this is from Revelation, <clears throat> Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. I like the way the King James Version puts this. For your pleasure they were created. Now, One could say that God created things, God the Godhead, created things because they wanted to. And that's one of the principal reasons that we know of is why they did that. Everyone who is called, this is from Isaiah 43, everyone who called by my name, and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. <clears throat> and in Psalm 22, this is the famous psalm quoted by Jesus when he was on the cross. It begins, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But later in that psalm, I will tell of your name, the name of God, to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. Now notice the Septuagint puts ecclesias. That is the word commonly used for the church in the New Testament. I will praise you. <clears throat> Then we're going to talk about uh, something. This is another little sideline. We're talking about the children. And uh, when uh, the writer of Hebrews says, the children you've given me, you've got to be very careful. But in Isaiah 7, a famous passage, the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, the evil king of Judah. You and your son Shear Jashub, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. And the note is that 
Shear Jashub means a remnant will return. And so I approached the prophetess. She conceived and gave birth to a son. Then the Lord said to me, Name him Maharshalel Hashbaz, which means hasting is he, the enemy, to the booty, swift to the prey. A couple of really strangely named kids. And then he said, Behold, I and the children, those two, whom the Lord has given me, are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, who dwells on Mount Zion. Back to Hebrews 2.13. And again I will put my trust in him, and again behold, I am the children whom God has given me. Now, the end of that story was that uh, Isaiah went with his two sons and confronted Ahaz. Ahaz had felt threatened by the Assyrians, and he had uh, tried to make a, a, a very unwise, or he had made a very unwise treaty. And so Isaiah went to Ahaz, and he said, you've done wrong. You have made a very bad treaty. God will protect you and your country. Ask him for a sign, any sign. Well, Ahaz got in a huff and says, I won't ask him for a sign. I wouldn't dare do that. And so Isaiah says, well, you're going to get a sign. And that's the famous passage when he said, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and he shall be Emmanuel, God with us. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, likewise took, partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless. Katergeo. It doesn't mean destroy or, or kill. The death he's talking about is through his own death not the one who had the power of death, the devil, but he rendered powerless. He made him of no effect, is another way it's put. The devil, Diabolos, the slanderer, the one that accuses the brethren, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. 1 Corinthians, Paul says in verse in chapter 15. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your strength? The death of the thing of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, who conquered death, who destroyed sin, and destroyed the guilt and the penalty of sin. Second Thessalonians, that lawless one, talking of the Antichrist, will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth, and bring to an end Catargeo by the appearance of his coming. Now, we don't want to go into that too much because it will distract us. But, 
one of the things that the Antichrist tried to do was kill everyone who would not worship him, and in particular, the Jews. He instigated something that Jesus called the Great Tribulation. And he said there wouldn't be anybody left alive if that hadn't been put to an end. It was put to an end, and it was put to an end by the second coming of Christ. And when the uh, Christ appeared at his second coming, he did not kill the Antichrist at that point. But what he did was katargeo, the word we just heard about, and he took away his power to kill people, and he, the French uh, standard version the, uh, of the Bible uh, translates that as he paralyzed him, which is a very good translation. Hebrews 2.16 Assuredly, he doesn't give help Epilambano, which really means take hold of angels, but he gives help to the descendant, the sperma of Abraham. Now, sperma, of course, is where we get sperm. It's the, the seed, if you will, of Abraham. So, Jesus is, is not going to help the angels. He is going to take a, he is going to take the part and help the descendant of Abraham. In Genesis 22, 17 and 18. In Genesis uh, 22, the final confirmation of the Abrahamic covenant. <clears throat> God says, Indeed, I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed. Now, in the Hebrew, at zero, the Septuagint says sperma. That's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. As the stars of the heaven and the sand on the seashore, your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now, let me just note a couple of things. You see, seed here, sperma, is singular. It is not plural. And while he said you'll have many seeds uh, Lots of people be the father of nations. The seed is singular and it specifically refers to Christ, the ultimate seed of Abraham. For you are a holy people, talking about the Jews, to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. This is what we call the fact that Israel is the elect of, Christ, of God. He has chosen them. Now the promises uh, in Galatians, here's Galatians 3.16, the promises were spoken to Abraham, the Abrahamic promises, and to his seed, singular. He does not say, as to many seeds, plural, as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is, Christ. And if you belong to Christ, 
then you are Abraham's descendants, sperma seed, heirs according to promise. Back to Hebrews. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things. And he's talking about Christ now. So that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make propitiation, helaskomai, propitiation, satisfaction for the sins of the people. Now, let me point out something here. All of a sudden, he has introduced something, and it's, we're going to have to spend some time on that later. But he has introduced a term for Jesus, the merciful and faithful high priest. Well, let me remind you that Jesus came from, uh, not from the tribe of Levi, but from the tribe of Judah. And so he is not a Levitical high priest, and we're going to have to look at that later. Since he himself was tempted, parazo, tested. Now, we tend to think of tempted as meaning enticed to commit sin, and that is one meaning of it, but Testing is another aspect of the same word. In that, he, in that he has, in that which he has suffered, he is able to the, come to the aid of those who are tempted or tried, tested. The high priest has been through everything that we have been through but without sin. Second Corinthians 5.21 He, God, made him Jesus, who knew no sin on our behalf, to, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God the Father declared, imputed, that God the Son would be sin, so that he could be punished on the cross for our sins. And this is put upon someone who never committed sin. The law came in so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we run over a little bit, maybe. But this brings us to the end of chapter 2. So next time we will begin at the beginning of chapter 3. May God bless you. And we ask God, Lord, please, let us have strength and stamina to simply last out this pandemic of virus. So that even though now we feel alone, perhaps abandoned, we cannot congregate. We cannot look to our brethren for help and succor. 
But Father, we ask that this be ended soon so that we may openly and loudly praise your name. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.